I really appreciate it. Um, I apologize if this is a little rough. Uh, this is my second time giving this, and it's been modified quite a bit from the original. Um, the way I approached this talk was I wanted to pretend I was someone that was a small to medium business. Uh, the system admin or the uh, information security officer for a small to medium business. And my CTO came to me and said, hey, we need to move to the cloud because it's what everyone's doing and rah, 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 and it's a great idea or something. Um, how would I try and evaluate uh, both Amazon and Azure being the major players? How would I evaluate these two to try and figure out which one would make my job as a security analyst easier? Um, full disclosure, there will be some bias here. I work for Microsoft. I am in the Azure Forensics Department. Um, so I do that all the time. Uh, so that, that's kind of the bias that you're going to see. A um, little bit about me. Uh, I work for Cloud and AI. I think that's what our name is today uh, under Microsoft. It used to be Cloud and Engineering and then something else before that. Um, yay, Black Lodge. We put things on for free. Um, please donate, become a member, um, help contribute to projects and, and help folks learn new stuff that helps them get better jobs. Um, what kind of went over it just a moment ago. Dan, any chance you could twist it just a tiny bit that way? That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, why? The goal of a forensics case is to present the facts, uh, to present those facts in a way that they cannot be refuted, and to present those facts in a way that they are preserved, they are orderly, and they make, ideally, they make a case for conviction of someone doing bad stuff. Uh, or at the very least, they generate lots of really cool IOCs that you can go make rules from. <sighs> High level considerations. There's a lot of legal requirements that you're going to have if you're doing forensics and assume every forensics case is going to go to the point where you refer it to law enforcement for a prosecution. Um, that would be, I have a case, someone attacked me, my business, they did a bunch of nasty stuff. Um, I want to document all that and then I'm going to refer that to FBI or local police or some law enforcement body and say, here is my body of work that proves this person did these bad things and broke these laws and cost this amount of money, do you law enforcement want to prosecute? Um, so for things like that, it's going to be really important because it's law enforcement to hash all the things, to maintain your chain of custody. I took this picture. It's really nice. Look at all that. Uh, <clears throat> Another thing to consider, especially in common times right now, um, say I'm a medium-sized business and I have uh, European assets or European parts of the company. That data that lives on those European sites or European servers has certain data sovereignty laws, meaning I can't download that to the US and do forensics on it because I may be breaking laws that that data lives in. Um, this really is a big deal right now for stuff like Germany, which has some of the most awesome privacy laws for individuals. Um, so. Uh, uh, as part of this, I'm going to go over um, do's and don'ts, how to keep that data in that region to make sure that you don't move it out and you can still take that to court uh, with that data t sovereignty uh, intact. Um, internal concerns for, for my company, for me, um, yeah, yeah, I've got to preserve evidence, whatever. Uh, maybe not really a big internal company thing. but. Protecting my internal network. Um, do I want to do this on my everyday work machine? Hell no, because my creds are on there. And if I'm sysadmin or security, those creds may be able to go anywhere in the environment. So standalone machine the best, rah, rah, rah. Um, something with no outbound internet connectivity. This depends on the case you're working. But 
I may or may not, on the machine I'm doing forensics, want something to call out to a C2 node and download more files. This really depends on where you are in your investigation, what type of adversary you're, you're dealing with. Um, and yeah, don't do it on your work machine. Um, kind of setting the stage for things that you want to look out for. Um, alerting and storage. Sims are awesome, sims are great. Uh, you're going to spend a shit ton of time or a bunch of money to set up a sim. Um, you, you're storing it off the machine. Uh, so I, I guess on disk logging. It's cheap, it's free. You've already bought the machine, it's got enough space for all those logs. Yeah, they'll roll. Yes, the logs will be vulnerable to deletion, to uh, meddling, to removal. Um, but you'll also have all of those logs, including all of your IIS, WECWEF, uh, SQL, whatever you're running on that server. So on disk is great, but you have some risks of bad guys fucking with it. Um, your sim logging, you're running a whole other server, you're running a big backend database, uh, you're possibly paying a crap ton for it if it's something like ArcSight, if it's something uh, big and popular. Uh, but you're going to have a bunch of these logs. Users uh, authing correctly, users authing failed, uh, new users created. Um, this is a link for NSA. It's a little bit old, but it's actually an awesome list of Windows alerts you would want to keep track of. So again, I apologize. Here's kind of a bias. A lot of this will be Windows-centric um, because that's what I deal with the most. Um, one of the cool open source tools that I've been using a little bit, not every day in work because it's a big company and we can pay for the fancy whatevers. Autopsy is really cool. Uh, not endorsed or anything, but uh, they do a pretty good job of timelining stuff as a one button click go forensic tool. Um, so moving into kind of the imaging tools, the te techniques you're gonna use, the processes you're gonna use, but not necessarily the tools, because those tools will change depending on the budget of your company, depending on what type of uh, operating system it is, what type of environment you're in. Um, two major types of forensics in investigations, memory and disk. Um, ideally, you want both. That memory, if you're familiar with it, is going to be so much faster. Um, from that memory, you'll be able to pull out all of the really cool things with direct pointers to disk, where they're coming from, or if they're just living in memory. Um, it's faster if you know how to do it. It also might be the only way to catch it if it's an advanced actor or a nation state, something really nasty. Hopefully, you don't have to deal with that. Um, just a disk forensics, still super common, can yield a crap ton of detail. Um, and I'm going to be going over quite a bit of that. Uh, so you've got a lot of all-in-one tools. They cost a lot. Uh, in case sans sift, you can actually build your own and is awesome. Um, FTK has a bunch of different varietals of software that can do memory, that can do disk, that can um, give you a bunch of cool toys. X-Ways, you can do memory, you can do disk. That's mainly forensics. I mentioned sleuth kit and autopsy because it's something free that you can play with and like sink your teeth in and kind of learn some of the techniques and have a tool that does some stuff. Um, modular and scalable. Uh, probably the biggest tools I use on a daily basis are something like FTK Lite, just for dumping image contents or disk image contents, and PowerShell. Um, Python would definitely be uh, a second for Windows forensics and a primary for uh, Linux forensics. Um, super, super powerful, either one of those. Um, so memory forensics tools. One thing to think about is these tools are written by third parties. Very rarely are they released by Linux Foundation or Windows itself. Um, so these are third party tools reverse engineering the way Linux or Windows builds that memory. Um, so some of these tools may work great in certain circumstances. Some of these tools may completely crap out and give you nothing. Um, I tried to list these in uh, alphabetical order just to be impartial. Um, Dump it's really great. FTK, if you can afford it, has a lot of awesome features. 
uh, Magnet Forensics has a free trial. Uh, you can pretty much do everything you can with the full product uh, for free playing around on your own stuff, which I think is awesome. Um, Lime is going to be your primary for Linux at this point. Uh, a lot of the DD stuff kind of got killed, I think, in kernel 2.6 something. Um, so Lime, uh, Linux memory grabber is something that you can throw on a USB stick. It's based off Lime. Margarita Shotgun, I believe, is specific to uh, AWS, but uh, looks super awesome. I didn't get the chance to run it and play around with it a whole lot. Um, so as part of this, um, the process, I'm, I'm going to go over the process for cloning memory, how to export it. Um, with that export, I, I don't have a whole lot of content that I, at this point, um, give me about six months, I'll come back and do a memory forensics course. Uh, but it'll be identifying those rogue processes, rogue DLLs that are in memory, um, the, the code injection points or the root kits if you've got memory resident only stuff. Um, but mainly with this memory forensics, as you're starting, you're going to be exporting those objects and you're going to be interested in the links to the static files on disk. And that memory will give you, if, if you can read it, the quickest way to those nasty files on disk. Um, woo, investigation starts. If it's a physical location, you're basically grabbing the machine. Um, grabbing the machine in a, I'm going to try and get a memory dump, or I'm going to try and grab the, the static hard drive. Um, so say I've already dumped the memory via um, either a USB tool, shoved in the machine, ran a couple of commands. Um, something to think about here is you are interacting with the machine that way. Um, you need to have a backup uh, basically a test machine where you run some, what it, whatever way you're grabbing the memory, you need to baseline what memory it changes when you do it. Whether it's, uh, I've got a local admin account I created on the box I'm going to gather memory from, and I'm using something like uh, one of the FTK tools that I can send over the internet or over the local network to the machine, use local admin and WMI and install, and then dump this memory to storage somewhere you need to have that documented, all of the artifacts that it changes, all of the memory that it changes. Same if you're using a USB. Um, if you're grabbing dead disk forensics, um, which still has a lot of awesome stuff, grab your write blockers, um, mount it, hash all the things, capture your images. Um, there's quite a few physical, there's also software stuff that you can do. It really depends how much you think you're gonna be in court for this. Um, yeah. Starting out, you're probably not going to have a bunch of fancy rate blocker crap. You probably will not need it or ever justify it in a, a small business. Um, hash all the things, export all the interesting things. I'm going to go over that and uh, save all the interesting logs. Woo! So Azure Memory Capture, say it's not a machine in your local office or network. Say it's a machine in Azure and I'll do the same for AWS. Um, you can do a very similar procedure to if it was a machine in your local office. Uh, I can create a forensic VM in that same data center, um, put all my tools on it, and then I can either clone the hard drive or snapshot the hard drive in Azure and then mount it. There's seats. Um, or there, there's seats here. Um, so I can either clone that hard drive and, oh shit, I'm doing memory capture. Sorry, thank you for your patience. Um, so you could create that VM in a local VNet. Um, and if you have it in the local VNet, you can use tools like that FTK where um, I log in using a local admin to the machine that's in the same network. I spit all those memory files off to my storage container that I just built as my forensic VM. Um, you can also do a similar thing where create a memory storage module, load all the stuff that you would put onto a USB, and then mount that to your infected or compromised VM um, and run it the same way you would a USB. 
Um, so very similar, just a couple of tweaks to go from physical office to Azure. Um, there is also an alternate method. Um, the problem that I have with this is to get this share diagnostic information from everything I was playing around with, I have to have an EA or like a enterprise level agreement with Microsoft. I have to open a support ticket. I have to tell them to go do this. They run it, uh, which is awesome. They pause the VM. Uh, advantages of hypervisor, they can dump all the memory. Uh, I'm not 100% positive that I actually get this exact dump or I have to work with them on a case where they help me troubleshoot or perform forensics. Um, the advantage to it being in hypervisor is they can dump a Linux or a Windows um, memory dump instantly, uh, approximately 10 minutes. Um, both, your, both the tools for either doing it remotely or in the same VNet in the same uh, region or doing it via uh, a storage container slash USB. Both these would work for Windows and or Linux. Um, so not bad. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit funky about this and I've got I've to gotta dig a little bit deeper and actually uh, pay for an account that will allow me to create a ticket and see if a, a full support ticket with them and, and figure this out. Um, I would say here's where Azure kind of shines on getting a dead disk, an image capture. It's, you, you can kind of see it over here. It says export, and I can download the file. Like that, that's about as one button as you get. Um, now again, I wouldn't do this if this is German data or EU data or somewhere else. I would do a, a, a create snapshot. I would clone it in that same region I would spin up a forensic VM in that region and I would mount it to it, um, which would allow me to do local forensics in that region, keeping data sovereignty. Um, but if I'm a small business, if I'm in the US, if all my data is in the US, one button and I download my VHD and I can, I can use all the tools I have in my office. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, I think that covers, uh, oh, you can also do create snapshot via PowerShell. Um, you can use PowerShell to move that snapshot. You can use PowerShell to mount that snapshot to something else. So from the standpoint of if you're doing this day in, day out, PowerShell here is your tool to make this really awesome. Um, so it's easy to make it a rinse repeat process if you're building this out for Maybe you're a small business providing cloud services to other people. Maybe you need to have that service where, yeah, we'll do forensics for you if your crap gets owned. Uh, you're definitely going to use all of these PowerShells. And there are some publicly available. Microsoft publishes some, but nothing end-to-end -end like you would need uh, or like I have available to me. <coughs> so, yeah, preserve your Oh, another thing, it's the cloud, storage are cheap. Storage is cheap. If you're doing something like this in the cloud, um, it's not a bad idea to make two copies. Maybe even if you can, make them data center, center redundant. Uh, you're never going to pay with something like this for moving data within the data center. Generally, you're only going to pay when it leaves the data center. But worst case scenario, if this is actually going to court, you want two copies of that data. You want an untouched version, and then you want a version that you're playing around with. Most tools are going to have write block or um, write temporary features. You're probably going to want a second copy of that just to have that original hash, just to have that untouched data. Uh, AWS memory capture. Um, again, same, same techniques would be used for uh, creating a VM in that region, using the VM to laterally move and install or run something like Lime against your compromised VM. Um, you can also create an S3 storage container. Use it like a USB, mount it to your compromised machine. Again, like you are messing with the logs on that machine because you're then logging into your compromised machine to run those tools off the USB or that storage container. 
So that's why it's important to have a baseline of what this change is on your image. Um, but these would be ways to dump the memory to storage in the cloud. Um, AWS has an alternate method. Um, they've got EC2 rescue. Uh, for Windows, they've got a GUI. Obviously, they don't for Linux. But you've got command line tools that you can do a very similar thing. And for both of these, you've got collects any memory dump. I'm not exactly sure how they do it, but awesome. Um, this appears to be more for troubleshooting from like, they've got a video on how to do it. It, it was actually really nice and awesome. Um, and that's going to be one of my findings that I go back to to the teams that I work with and be like, hey, why the fuck don't we have anything that clearly explains how to do this? Um, but you can do it yourself. You can run it yourself via PowerShell. Um, you are not dependent on opening up a ticket on creating a request or having a support agreement with Azure or, or uh, AWS. So I liked that feature a lot. Um, AWS Image Capture. Um, Azure has its own PowerShell modules. AWS does as well. Um, something I didn't really like about AWS or, or find it frustrating, um, you can't do basically a one-click download. Uh, if, if you've got local data, if you know you can do forensics on it locally, um, you've got to export that EC2 instance to an EC3 or an S3 bucket, sorry. Um, pretty easy command though, one line, um, and you can pick the format you want that in. So you can choose VHD, you can choose uh, DD, you can choose whatever you want. And then you can either, either mount that S3 bucket to your forensics VM, or you could download it. Um, rah, 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 keep data in region. Um, you're not moving it out of region, so you're saving, you're not going to get billed a bunch for it. Um, oh, uh, so sample mounting something with FTK, like it's add a disk. Ooh. Open FTK and mount your disk, dump data. It, exporting is super easy once you've got something mounted in the cloud. Um, it's like it's locally accessible. Um, so sample situation, um, I've either got something locally or I've got something in the cloud where if it's local, uh, Bob's computer acted funny, he shut it down. Oh my god, it's infected. Or it's Azure, AWS, my dev team said, this has got a ton of data coming out of it, we don't know what it is, this is bad, and they turned it off. In both those situations, I would have a dead disk. Um, so memory forensics is going to be a lot harder. Um, sorry, bias. Shadow copy is your friend in this case. It is amazing. Uh, most Windows versions now have hibernation files, even for servers. It's crazy. Uh, Shadow copy may have multiple versions of the hibernation file, which is almost exactly your memory. Uh, so that could have encryption keys, that could have uh, processes being run before the machine crashed or was shut off. All kinds of awesome data. Um, another thing that is super cool for shadow copy, um, say I'm a bad guy. I dumped all the data I wanted out of your SQL database. Um, I moved it off to my servers, and then I S deleted it from your machine. I secure deleted it. Ha ha, you'll never figure out what I exported. Um, shadow copy might have a copy of that because S delete will delete it from the uh, master file timeline. Basically, that you could probably get someone to go absolutely crazy searching empty space on the hard drive, maybe find that data. Or you can just jump back into shadow copy and say, hey, one week ago, did we have a copy of this file that I think was here and was deleted? We do. Um, shadow copy makes differential backups and saves them in a different spot. Um, there's a couple of tools, um, again, the tool you use to mount a VHD and the tool you use to explore something like shadow copy, trial and error. Um, I, I, I'm sure there are some one button things that work, but in my experience, 
it, have two or three tools and try them. Um, some of the mounting tools do not show any of the old volume shadow copy stuff. Um, I, I don't really have a good answer to what's magic there. Um, try and play around with it. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, we're in an investigation. We've got lots of stuff to dig through. Um, if I'm dumping things off of VHD, one of the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to dump all the Windows logs. Um, I'm going to dump hashes of everything, and I'm going to try and timeline that stuff. Um, I'm going to dump. Is there anybody watching the YouTube page that might be able to? Oh, look good call. Volunteering. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Lee. Um, dump all the things. Hash all the things. Um, obviously, all of your logs are going to be awesome, um, necessary. Um, registry jump and analysis. If someone's playing around with your file system, you're going to want registry. Link files, AM cache dump. Those are things that. Um, as Windows says, hey, we're making your experience better for you. We're remembering all the things you clicked on, all the things you saved, all the last documents you touched, all the... Uh, they're trying to make it better, and they're just preserving artifacts of the last things you touched, the last things you accessed. Um, and then kind of a, a, a moment of truth, the, the master file table. If someone's going around mucking with uh, your logs, going around mucking with your file, line, file timelines, that's going to be your, the closest thing you can get to truth on a dead disk. Um, you're also going to try and, with all of these, you're potentially dumping services, how things are starting, so your persistence mechanisms as well. Um, Windows event timeline, I'm sure everyone's probably seen it. Um, if you timeline it, Yay, you get to see all of the things in order. Uh, this is from a sample that I made for uh, the first case, or the first time I gave this talk. Um, here we have victim two getting brute forced. Wah, wah, wah. Um, again, logs, be it on the machine or in a sift, are going to be super important to give you that one thing to look for, that you find one thing malicious and say, this is where I'm going to start. I'm going to move backwards in time, and I'm going to move forwards in time and figure out everything this bad actor did. Um, so Windows event timeline will give you uh, unexpected logons. You know, if I get, hey, I've got a 4624 here, a successful login to victim admin. I was really creative when I made these names up. Sorry. It was <laughs> um, questionable file executions, the 4688s. You know, is something running from a weird spot? Is something running with a weird name? Um, and command line logs, something to kind of call out if you have, if you are a security folk for your company in a small business environment and you have sysadmin folks, tell them to enable command line logging. It's not that hard. It will be super helpful. Um, Windows logs, they're always in one spot. Um, notable logs that you might not think to look at first, uh, but PowerShell terminal services, super awesome. Um, system, you know, it, if someone's running crappy stuff that maybe wasn't built for your version of Windows, but they're just trying to go through it, system may have those crashes in it. Um, definitely a good spot. Uh, your 4624s, 4625s easily give you a point where you've got malicious activity starting. Um, hey, the guy logged in at this time. What did he do 15 minutes after? What did he do 15 minutes before? Or was he brute forcing? Is this just a random log on that can help you determine, you know, is this a random attacker or is this an inside threat? Is this, um, did they fish my users beforehand? Oh, this dude just logged in like that. Yeah, maybe, maybe I need to go see if we had some phishing going on earlier. Um, common login types for Windows. Uh, three is network, 10 is remote interactive. Um, there's another one in there that's really important too. Something as a defender that you want to think of. Um, if I do a remote interactive login, if I RDP to a box, my credentials are now stored on that box. Um, 
I can really totally destroy my network if I have permissions everywhere and I just gave a bad guy who could be running Mimi Cats on that box or something else my credentials. He could pivot anywhere. Um, we've seen the red team do this. It's really fun. Like, logged in to investigate something and we're like, yeah, I think it's the red team. Well, and then all of a sudden it was just the entire network lit up. And we're like, oh, that's somebody's alt creds. Yeah, that's a God account everywhere. Hey, red team, that was you, right? Yeah, not the place you want to be. Um, so a lot of these one-click tools uh, are for performing forensics are going to be type three. They're network, they dump files on the local machine and then they use WMI or something else to kick off uh, the activity. Um, you're not caching credentials with a network logon. Um, the other potential spot here is use something to create a local admin on the local machine and then log into it. If you think there's current activity on that machine, don't give them your creds. Give them a local admin that only works on that box. Ha <laughs> ha! And they've probably already got local admin, so what does it matter anyways? Um, process creation, super important. Tell you when bad stuff runs. Um, creating a baseline here is hard. Most people don't do it for their networks. Um, I, I, I've got no magic bullet here either. Um, it sucks to look at logs you've never looked at before because everything looks suspicious. Um, but if you have the time, yeah, do a baseline. What runs every time, every server, all over my environment? Um, blah, 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 terminal service stuff. Yeah, there's some cool stuff for uh, connection received, authentication success. Um, PowerShell stuff is really awesome. Most people probably won't have it turned on by default. Maybe another thing to, uh, again, kind of the difference between local machine, it's cheap to have logs. You've already bought the machine, you've already got the storage, the logs will roll. You're not costing yourself anything for those local logs. If you're piping all this stuff to a SIM, you're accruing a lot of cost. Um, be it network traffic, be it storage on that SIM, be it processing power that that SIM needs to go through all the data. Um, Windows event log analysis. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, oh. So the goal to build a timeline of all of your different log sources. Windows logs, they've got 30 different logs. They're not in one nice single timeline. Uh, so there's a bunch of PowerShell stuff that'll do that for you, and I'll share something along those lines for that. Um, command line logging, awesome, totally need it. Um, and yeah. Timeline, timeline, timeline. Oh, here we go, master timeline. Um, so that's, that's a free to use PowerShell that you point at a folder and say, here are all of the logs I dragged off my machine. Go put them into one master timeline. Um, super awesome, it's not what we use. We use something homebrewed, but almost identical. Um, and so you end up with logs from every single alert type and I picked a crappy screenshot because I don't have oh, source description. Yeah, I don't have which log these were actually pulled from. So it's not, uh, ideally I would have something here where it was, uh, this was pulled from security log, this was pulled from PowerShell log, this was pulled from uh, system log. This, one. But you get a beautiful single timeline. Now, you can totally screw with this if somebody wipes all your logs or kills them. Um, but I would say in 90 plus percent of your investigations, this will be where you find the bad stuff starts. No. GPS signal lost. <laughs> um, going back to enabling command line logging. So I, in my demo, did not have command line logging on my VM started. So. Like, I did some fun stuff. I pinged Bing, I did, uh, hey, I had a local admin. I'm gonna add bad admin. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, create a new user, set them up as local admin. I'm gonna uh, create a bunch of versions of, um, I think I used, what I, I might not have it here. Anyway, I ran a bunch of different versions of uh, um, Monero Miner. 
um, that are all kicked off from the command line. None of that shows up on a Windows machine unless you have this command line logging enabled. Um, so a short little how-to on there. Um, yeah, all I've got is user account was enabled, user account was changed, uh, reset accounts passed. Somewhere it should say it was made admin to or whatever. Um, this will give you so many more opportunities to create rules. Um, a really fun one is uh, encrypted PowerShell. If someone's running encrypted in PowerShell in my environment, what are they trying to hide? Um, and why are they running it? There are very valid reasons to do it. Um, if I'm using a script that has credentials in it, don't do this. Um, maybe I'll encrypt it. But it's pretty easy because it uses like base 64, so it's a really shitty idea. To, it's obfuscation, it's not encryption. Um, so there are tools that will actually de-base 64 stuff for ju from just generic uh, PowerShell encryption and give you live text that whoever is running in your environment. But this gives you, hey, I want an alert whenever someone promotes something to be local admin. Yeah, I want an alert on that. Like, why are people becoming local admin on my servers? Uh, this is an opportunity for a rule and improvement in your environment. Um, okay, logging deficiencies. Logs can be cleared, rolled. Uh, this is a backtrack. I mean, it, it's, I can time stomp something. I can wipe records from application system security. Poof, your logs are gone on the local box. Um, really sucks for you as an investigator, especially if you didn't have a sim. So how do you pick which alerts to back up? I would jump back to that uh, the FBI whatever list, um, which is pretty good. Um, maybe out of the box, some of these are going to work awesome. Um, they all require tweaking. Uh, Splunk, ArcSight, both awesome products. Um, rules out of the box might not fit your environment. Um, Nothing's perfect. Um, oh, file timelines. So a file timeline is going to give me lots of awesome info on what the bad guy did on the disk. Um, ideally, I've got memory forensics that point me to, to directly where the nasty stuff is. But if I don't have those memory forensics, I can combine my security logs or my event log timeline with my file timeline. And I can say, oh. All the bad stuff started on 9.12. I see the login at 16.20, and malicious files start appearing right after that. Huh. Yeah, and I'll brute. I think he was using it to fucking brute force other machines on 3.389 or um, XMR stack. Yeah, I think he's going to mine cryptocurrency on this. Um, so, uh, things to note. Uh, you're going to have three different timestamps on everything, creation, last access, and last write. Um, Windows doesn't really mess around with access time as much. You're never really going to get... The situations will be few and far between that you get last access time as a valid indicator. Uh, creation time, depending on if I'm extracting something from a zip file, if I'm copying something RDP from one machine to another, these creation times will be a little bit weird. Um, last write time, fairly accurate. Creation time, it's not always going to be great depending on how the file is moved to the server. Um, at some point further, I will deep dive on this. Uh, probably not this talk, but play around with if you think someone is doing something bad, you know, WinRAR showed up on the box and then all of these files have weird timestamps. Play around with WinRAR and make sure you understand how, or Google it, or <coughs> Bing it, Bing it, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that you know how that software treats files and how it manipulates these timelines. Because software can basically create and change any timestamp it wants. Um, a good one is like Word. If you start a Word document, um, or if you edit a Word document, it creates 
a new created time and a new modified time but it keeps it temporarily saved until you either save as new when it creates all new timestamps or if you save as modified it will go back and modify some of these things are just bizarre and crazy um, time stopping time stopping is eh, not super popular but some automated malware even will time stomp files so that they hide a DLL in system 32 and they time stomp that file so it, it appears like it was created the same time every other DLL in system 32 was or the oldest DLL in system 32. This can really make things weird. Um, mitigation is going to be your master file timeline. Um, I've got notes on this slide that actually have the tools that are really good for it. Um, uh, NCase will do it, FTK will do it, Xways, uh, MFT dump and analyze MFT are probably the best uh, open source. How do I go back to a slide? Shit. Uh, hey, hey, winning. All right. Um, that master file timeline gives you when each file was created in a irreputable format. So no matter how people muck with the timestamps of your files, that's going to be your, your moment of truth. Um, file hashes. So you, as part of your timelining process, ideally the PowerShell you're using, and I think the one I, I actually don't have a PowerShell. Uh, I will share as part of the slide deck um, a PowerShell tool that hashes all the things with that master file timeline. Um, but with PowerShell, with goofy APIs, or with tools you may own, um, you may want to run it against blacklists. Defender is an easy one. It's a free one. Yara is going to be free as well. That's kind of a heuristics one. Uh, Team Cummery. Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> These guys have a bunch of different sources that they use. Really a good resource. I think you have to pay for it still, though. Um, virus total. Um, you can totally just register as many keys as you want for that and just rotate through the keys. Not that I have ever done this, but you can only do like one every four minutes otherwise. So if you had a list of... If you're lazy and running a list of your whole disk, you need at least like 20 keys, but you just need new emails for all of them. <clears throat> Custom threat feeds. Uh, I'm not saying I would do that versus running it in Defender, but I would do that versus running it against a Defender blacklist. Um, you've got a lot more feedback from a lot of different companies um, if you run something in VirusTotal. Uh, again, never upload malware to VirusTotal. You are sharing that malware that you have found on your system with everyone in the entire world. Only check hashes. Hash the malware you find or the suspicious files you find on your machine and only check hashes. Never give your dirty secrets to someone else. Um, Whitelists are awesome. It, it's almost impossible to implement them on a wide scale. Um, NSLR is a national software Something something library? I, I, uh, and some threat feeds have whitelists. Um, some of the stuff Microsoft actually helps curate will have like every version of every file from every Microsoft OS, which is retarded, but it pulls out like 99% of everything in the Windows folder, which if you can get access to something like that makes your job super quick to find the weird questionable stuff um tools for checking a whole drive you've got stuff like autopsy you've got those big name one button click things that'll do it um powershell you can do a, a list um oh here we go here's one of the create a hash set um inside autopsy i can actually create custom hash lists if i've got say that national software 
registry library, I think it is, which is all known white, good stuff that people have submitted, I could throw that in here and check it against that and remove all those files. I could run a blacklist of known stuff that's bad in my environment or a blacklist that is uh, from a threat feed. So uh, even some of the free tools have awesome stuff like this. Um, oh, yeah, or the last step was uh, PowerShell or Python to adaptively change what you're querying, what sources you're querying, and uh, get that back, data back in a fast way. Um, registry analysis, um, it does have some unique stuff. I don't use it a whole lot. It's usually just kind of to confirm timeline of first time a process was ran. Um, sometimes you're gonna have weird artifacts in registry. It, um, so I've got, hypothetically, so I've got uh, NL brute running here. Um, but I've got multiple timestamps of it, and it really should just be like, it's not dependable to have a record of every single time something was accessed or run. Generally, you have like a 98% chance of recording the very first time something was run, and from where. Um, so it can be very interesting if you're looking through registry and you don't see these files on the disk anymore. What did someone do to get rid of these files? Again, try and go back to your volume shadow copy and grab those files from a previous version. Um, a lot of tools for registry stuff. Reg Ripper is really handy. Uh, written in Perl, dumps all the stuff. Uh, you can actually do command line. So you could automate this into PowerShell. Uh, it does have a GUI for people that like GUIs and need GUIs. Eh. Um, some of the cool stuff, you know, NT user dat. Um, you're going to end up with some interesting stuff about the users on that machine. Specifically, if you know, oh, the admin account was owned, that might be a place to go to dig a little bit further on that admin account and the behaviors. Um, Registry Explorer, you've got another woo GUI because it's Windows. Um, yeah, I don't think I've ever used this. I just included it because it's it's easy to see stuff. Um, a good note is that um, registry keys only have last write time, so you're going to see last modified time. Um, Timelining wise, that may or may not make differences. Uh, Link files, just kind of an interesting thing that you may end up, uh, sorry. So these are gonna be more where a file came from that was ran on the machine. Um, <clears throat> another thing to mention here is, um, One second. Oh, I don't have it in there. Um, there is, oh. Got to add a different slide. Might be the next one. Um, so link files, it's gonna have the source that the file came from. It's gonna have, you know, network share if it was pulled from there. Or, so this could be a recently run file. Where was that recently run file from? Was it from a network share? Was it from a USB drive? These things might give you indicators on how the machine was compromised or, if files were moved off and then checked to make sure everything was still valid. Uh, could be an indication of um, exfiltration of data. Oh, zone identifiers. Zone identifiers are a um, alternate data stream. So you won't really see them in most situations unless, again, you've got big box programs, one click stuff, will bring them out. Um, there are some command line tools, but if you ever see something with a zone identifier three, that means it was downloaded from the internet. That's how Windows gives you that annoying, like, you, this is from the internet, it might not be safe. Um, you can stop these or delete these, but they are interesting to, if I'm gonna look at everything with a zone identifier three from the point I know the bad guy was on my machine till the time I brought it down. Um, 
So this is autopsy looking at some of those link extensions from the last slide. Um, calls them out really quickly, really easily. Uh, things that ran recently. Yeah, Defender, woo! Um, AM cache, again, similar to registry. Super awesome, kind of a pain in the ass to deal with. Um, AM cache should have every executable run, the full path information, uh, the last modified date, um, last runtime is equivalent. And it should have hashes. That's the other awesome thing for this. Um, the AM cache should have a hash of the files that are run. Um, so going back to if my disk has been completely wonked by the bad guy, I may not have those malicious files anymore. At least I might have a hash. Um, hopefully I can go back to that, the uh, volume shadow copy, but it might not be there. Um, jump lists, yeah, they're present in Windows 8, Windows 10. These are kind of going back to that Windows tries to make things easier, faster, more user friendly. Um, you're going to end up with stuff that it recommends. Hey, you just uh, went into these Outlook, uh, or you just sent email to these people. You just uh, were editing these Word docs. Um, jump lists are going to be really easy for that. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of different explorers for those. Um, super easy. I, they're interesting. I mean, you're going to end up with, with full file paths. You're going to end up with... Uh, some of the stuff about when that file was created, when it was accessed, when it was modified. Um, these are just alternate streams for finding facts in Windows. They're finding nasty stuff in Windows. Um, other places to hunt. And, and so, kind of hopefully ending kind of the, the Windows -centric, centric part. Like, there are a bunch of different places that you can look on both Windows and Azure machines for did a malicious user bring data in or exfiltrate data out. Um, pretty much anything P2P, like for Skype, Telegram, chat. Uh, you've also got a bunch of file sharing programs now, Dropbox, et cetera. A lot of those do have installs. All of those installs have logs. Um, if people are using a web version of it, it may be a little bit harder to find the data, but there is some, still some data that exists. All right, so we've gotten to the point where we've documented all our stuff. We think we've got a pretty good timeline. Um, did the bad guy try and create any form of persistence? Um, for a Windows machine, uh, that generally comes down to registry keys uh, as one of the sources, run once, et cetera, uh, or run. Um, Registry is one way to do it. Uh, startup, super simple. Um, some automated stuff will throw stuff in startup. Some automated stuff will do registry keys. Um, not super hard to find. Um, kind of fun when you do, because you're like, yay, easy mode. Um, services, there are some stuff that will either do services or DLLs, and those are a little bit more interesting. Um, I think, I don't think that was, yeah, so this was for my little sample um, case that I did. Um, I used a non-sucking service manager or something, just a free little standalone to create something called Defender Scanner. And uh, I basically picked uh, crypto note, CPU miner, blah, 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 and said, hey, call this Defender 64 and start it every time the machine starts. Um, it's not super complex, but surprisingly, it gets around a lot of stuff. Um, again, kind of a fun one when you find it. Uh, da, 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 da. So kind of going back to that timeline, all we need is one suspicious event to start that process of digging left and right. Um, this is actually a shot from uh, autopsy. Um, your mileage may vary with these. Um, with systems that are designed 
as one button click, like just go because I don't know what the fuck that means. It's a bunch of red. Oh shit. Um, similarly, like timelining stuff. Some of these tools do a good job. Some of these just, I don't know what the hell it's doing. Um, so timelines are great. Timelines are awesome. Sometimes looking at a spreadsheet is easier than looking at a GUI from a one button, one click solution. Um, that's my opinion. Oh, again, all of these opinions are mine, all mine, not my company's, rah, rah, rah. Sorry, I probably should have said that at the beginning. Um, so autopsy does give you some stuff for, hey, something bad was run, create file time, weird. Um, you can also find that just in a PowerShell timeline history. You can see those exact things with your hashes. You can run multiple hash types if you want. SHA-1 and SHA-256, fine, done. Uh, it's all just a, a line in that PowerShell. Um, if you combine that file timeline with your uh, Windows event logs, you've got a very clean, very concise uh, marching of events that can give you uh, how the the malicious actor is moving sideways or laterally. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of timestamps. Um, 4616 if time zone was changed. Uh, if you're working across the world, remember most logs are going to come in in the local machine time zone. Um, again, PowerShell you can pull, or Python, you can pull local machine time. You can auto-correct that local machine's time to GMT or Zulu. Um, remediation, is it worth my time to, uh, to actually fix this machine? Um, say I've documented all the bad stuff, the malicious actor never made it off the machine into the rest of the network. Um, do I just wipe and baseline? Eh, in a lot of cases, yeah. Um, is it super important data? Am I actually getting, do I have backups of it? Can I go back and redo those? Maybe. Um, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. And preserve data for legal. Uh, so you may not have the ability to rebuild that VM or, or rebuild from known good because... You may have to build from new uh, because that has to be preserved for legal reasons. Um, building a report, so kind of wrapping it up. Um, considerations, audience and scope. Is this just going to my team? Is it a lessons learned? Is this going to my manager and his manager? Uh, I've got to have you know the correct uh, fluffy executive summary. I've got to have the, the findings and then I've got to have uh, a bunch of other stuff. Um, is this going to legal? Shit. Uh, make sure it's just facts, not opinions. Um, this is an investigation, not, eh, we think they did this. Um, so that goes back to your timelines, your logs. Um, should contain events, executive summary, evidence collected, analysis methodologies. Um, this is actually where you're gonna come back in and if you used something for memory forensics, um, your analysis methodologies may include the type of tools you used and the known artifacts they create. Um, especially if this is going to law enforcement, you're going to have to include something like that. Uh, blah, 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 and conclusion. Uh, building new detection. So if you've got something like that, um, command line logging, you've got all the nastiness that they did, those can go into new rules. Those can go into detections that will hopefully help you alert faster and find badness sooner. Um, file hashes, register keys, IP addresses, eh, depending on what kind of monitoring you have in your system or in your environment, these may or may not be valid things for you. Um, gaps in incident monitoring, PowerShell logging is another big one. Um, feedback loop for detections. There's no perfect IOC that lasts forever. Um, it just doesn't exist. Um, work with your alerting team. Make sure you validate these detections going forward. You don't just set it and leave it forever. Um, and time out. If, if false positives will appear on some of these. So um, that's kind of the end of my official talk. I do have some bonus slides about Monero mining and how to hopefully track the bastards and like kick them in the balls if anyone would like to see the Monero slides.
Yay, nay. Yeah. Is it lunchtime? Is it? All right. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, if you ever have problems with shit from Microsoft, send it to cert at Microsoft.com, or you can go to cert.microsoft.com. That was actually, so that's kind of who I work with, and this talk was related to that. Um, you can also contact me or anything at hats.com, H-A-T-T-Z. So bonus slides. Part of this was like, I face crypto mining all the time in the cloud. It's really fun and free because you're using someone else's resources and you can just scale it up and use all kinds. So um, a little bit about it. Most miners are direct hash to pool. A pool will combine a bunch of users, hashes, and um, it all the work is shared then. And that pool will credit people back based on the amount of work they did. Um, so you'll find that, hey, Lee, can you tell Spoonie we're like five, 10 minutes? Just hold it, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so uh, network traffic to a pool server is a really awesome way to find bad miners in your environment. Um, problem with this is more, and you can actually buy uh, mining pool lists commercially uh, for products. A lot of the big box products have them in there already. So your network, your network monitoring rules are already looking for these and alerting on them when you see traffic because it's a very specific IP, a very specific port. Um, however, some of the malicious mining tools are already like prepackaged. They run with uh, proxies. So it, it's already killing it. So you're, you, you have to go back to command line. You have to go back to process monitoring. Um, proxies on the rise. I, oh, but if you get an old school one, you've got a config file and that gives you so much awesome stuff. Uh, so these are some sample config files. Um, you've got where it's mining to, the address, possibly the payment ID, a worker, an email, or even a password. Um, I won't say I've ever found this, but uh, a friend one time saw someone with the email and the password for a miner to a site and maybe that was uh, the password for other stuff associated with that email. So you can really hose people with bad social uh, security or bad uh, operational security. Um, a lot of times you'll end up with username, worker names, or um, worker passwords. All of these things are information that you can use to identify a malicious actor. Um, your email is always one of my favorites. Miner gate just sucks uh, for operational security because it just gives stuff like that out. And uh, so another thing, um, your address and the pool is all you need. Oh, shit. All right, that's probably the next slide. So config file, what pool they're mining to. Uh, from that, you can figure out the pool and the user account or the address. You can figure out where they're mining, how much they're mining, how often the payouts are, how much they've made. Uh, you may also be able to figure out associated with that address, is there a wallet, is it a cloud wallet, and is it a physical wallet? Um, and if it's a cloud-based wallet, you may be able to seize assets. Um, so example of tracking a miner, this is me mining a crap coin, um, but from this config file, I'm able to go to the website, I'm able to plug in the address, and I'm able to see exactly what's being mined at the moment. So if I, as law enforcement, go back to this pool, and I say, go freeze that account. Here's the legal paperwork. This is vandalism, theft, cyber terrorism, whatever the fuck you want to call it, I don't know. Um, freeze it. They're probably gonna do it, because one, they don't want to piss off law enforcement or deal with legal anything. Two, if they freeze someone's account, they get to keep all the shit. So they have an economic incentive to freeze a bad guy's account so that they don't have to pay him out anything. And if his bots keep running, they keep making money. Might not be much, but they do keep making money. So um, you really have the opportunity here to kind of strike back at people doing malicious things. Um, depending on the type of coin, and, and this kind of goes above and beyond, uh, depending on the type of coin, you may be able to actually track that coin address back to a person. 
uh, track it back to a personal wallet through uh, coin transactions. Aeon is kind of like Monero. It's a real pain in the ass to track stuff. Basically impossible. Um, you're not going to see these transactions person to person. Uh, so, But Bitcoin, Ethereum, you would definitely see these transactions and potentially be able to track them back to a person. And there are companies right now that are making a crap ton of money helping people do this. Um, so again, potential legal resources. Uh, reach out to the mining pool. Say, freeze this. It's doing bad stuff. Uh, even CoinHive, which is super shady. Um, they are like Java in a website that makes your machine mine and gives it to the website. So there have been a couple of really big... Uh, um, some malicious actor will compromise a website add-on and add the CoinHive code so it goes out to, you know, 300,000 websites or something as part of the code. Um, so CoinHive will freeze it. They are shady as shit, and they will keep all the funds. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you can legally request information associated with an asset or an address owner. So if I'm mining to a pool, I'm probably logging into that pool to check what my balance is or how much my miners are working, blah, blah, blah. Easily pulled. Um, for exchanges, if I'm dumping coins out from a pool to an exchange, you can freeze there, potentially seizing multiple currencies because pools are good for trading assets. Um, online wallets, freeze wallet. Offline wallet, ah, you're kind of fucked, uh, depending on the coin. But questions, questions, questions? And I will be back in about six months for uh, a memory forensics one, because this was a little bit light. Did he say I sucked? Oh. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and I. That Microsoft don't recommend turning on the command line logging because of the potential of people putting in passwords. To every oh yeah, time. that too. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, and memory analysis wise, pretty much the only thing that the, the industry standard tool is volatility, volatility, and it will be uh, functional for both Windows and Azure or Windows and Linux. I apologize for kind of my biases in this talk, um, mainly being Windows centric and mainly being uh, Azure focused, but that is where I work. So, you know, um, totally open to random questions, emails, follow ups. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions or anything like that. Uh, thank you to Panic, our god in the sky, recording all of this and live streaming it. Um, and I think I'm done. <laughs>